One of the greatest impacts on programs is how we train and educate youth workers, particularly the stances and the practices in which we raise them. So I wondered, how do newcomers learn the practice, the beliefs and the values underlying the practice, and the larger debates in the field? How do they learn to position themselves in a stance that is responsive to what kids need, particularly at a time when there are greater and greater mandates on what is to be done and how it's to be done during after school hours? It seems critical that if what many people who've been in the field for a long time, who I call the old timers, have learned about youth work should remain the ethos of the work, then we need to ensure that it's understood and that it's carried on. Of course, in some ways it seems too late as youth work is really now school light as my friend Mike Heathfield wrote in his chapter in the book, charged with fixing AYPs and those trench in the trenches doing transformative work, saving kids' lives, are losing and have lost a lot of their funding. <clears throat> in New York right now, we just are about to lose 47,000 seats for young people because of funding cuts. And I'm getting emails daily on updates. And some of what's happening there is happening around the country. And as I've gone around the country this year, I can really say it's happening around the country. That many of the community-based organizations that had kind of grassroots youth-serving programs based on who the kids were in that community, what they needed, what they wanted, are falling by the wayside particularly moving towards programs that are within school buildings. And the programs that are in the housing projects are almost completely gone. So there's a calling to the work that I have because I do feel that there's a danger inherent in that. And I always ask that while there may be things to gain, there's also maybe things that can be lost, and we need to look at both sides of that. That said, today we understand the necessity of providing professional development for supporting effective and healthy practitioners wherever they work. But there is an interesting tension in the professional education of youth workers. And that tension, to me, lies in the kind of trial by fire induction that most of us entered this world in. And as a recent friend of, uh, a friend of mine recently told me, and I quote, she says, my first memory as a community youth worker was so chaotic and terrifying. I was a 17 year old kid, a counselor, with a group of kids and I was told, just get them to do arts. There was no training, no supervision. There was no place to talk about the problems. She says, I begged two hospitals to let me go visit the dying people instead. On the flip side, Jerry Fuster writes in his book, Being in Child Care. Realizing that my effectiveness is based on my openness to learn from personal experience I suspect that the training I received took me in the opposite direction. Presenting the false confidence of theories and the shallow competence of controlling practices, it was easy for me to hide from myself and from the world. In that place, I de deny myself the pleasures and pains of learning and take on the anesthesia of the expert. This really has struck me. Maybe in part because I was never sure that any theories helped me to see what I needed to see with the young people that I was working with. Could I see what I needed to see and do transformative work through the gaze of academia? 
Could I myself allow myself to be transformed? So then I wondered, what is the balance? What is the balance between helping new practitioners begin the job with the skills and the confidence to engage young people in transformative experience and the overtraining that might lead to the numbing of one's senses. So here I looked at youth work education in the United States, asking whether by design we are supporting the development of practitioners who while trained in an understanding of youth know that the understanding they hold should remain open to scrutiny. And because my own knowing should also remain open to scrutiny, I invite you today, the in-house audience, the online audience, to have a conversation with me today to provide me with your thoughts, your feedback, your comments, your questions on this work because it really is um, a collaborative process in terms of what happens now, what happens next. <clears throat> so Minnesota was a good site for my research. And the foundation for youth work education was laid more than three decades ago here with the work of Professor Kanapka and the National Youth Work Education Project. More than 20 years later, after Professor Kanapka began that work, there, be there became a growing understanding of the importance in investing in the workforce. In the early 1990s, the Wallace Foundation invested $55 million over a 10-year period for workforce development in national organizations like the Y and the Boys and Girls Clubs. And some of this work continues today. However, in the current fiscal climate, foundations are showing less interest in funding professional development initiatives. And this is quite unfortunate because we know that without skilled staff, the youth outcome simply will not be there. In fact, the research shows over and over and over again, it's probably our most robust finding, that the key to quality programs are the relationships, the relationships between the staff and the young people. So if we are to advocate that professional education is a necessary condition of critical youth outcomes, then we will need not only cogent arguments that training is more than just nice, we will need collaborative models of shared resources, as well as deep understandings of what the work should be. Over the course of the academic year, I interviewed key players in youth service organizations, extension faculty who lead non-credit trainings and fellowship programs, university faculty who teach in degree programs. I observed several youth studies courses at the undergraduate and graduate level, visited youth programs to talk with staff about their experiences with professional development, and collected course materials and some student products. And while Minnesota remained the main site of the research, I also included some other universities, such as the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Extension, Cornell University Extension, and the University of Pittsburgh's Applied Developmental Psych Program. And these universities are comparable to what you have here in that they have strong scholarship in youth work and they have a history with offering the Advancing Youth Development Training, which is an exemplary curricular of the Building Exemplary Systems for Training Youth Workers. That's a mouthful, but it is known as BEST. And the BEST initiative was launched in the 90s and some of that work um, carries on today through some of the extension centers. I also had an opportunity to visit one of the best intensive trainings in Boston a couple of months ago. So I spent a lot of time on the road and had many, many conversations and I didn't have the clearest of directions when I began this. So really, the research questions, it was more of an inductive process of science as opposed to a deductive process of science, where the questions kind of emerged as I moved forward, as I allowed myself to be in the worlds that I was in, and as I allowed myself to kind of ask, what am I learning and what else do I need to know? Three questions emerged pretty early on. 
The first is what is the landscape of youth work education in the United States, or who's doing what where? YOED, by the way, is my short script for youth work education. What is the knowledge base of YOED? What is important to learn? What is the design of YOED? How is it being done? So these first three questions required a bit of a mapping exercise, laying out what I call the geography of YOED. Once I had the geography mapped, two additional questions emerged that became phase two of the study. And these questions were more sociological and anthropological and morphed into this kind of notion of a three-dimensional sphere. This countered the kind of visual representation of phase one as geographical, unidimensional. So that in the sphere, you can kind of peel back some of the layers and get deeper into how people think about youth work, education, youth work, youth work education. So the two questions that emerged in the second phase, what conditions are needed for youth workers to develop their professional capacity with and on behalf of young people? And how do the current approaches to YOED emerge from and inform our understandings of youth work, youth work, youth work education? Answering these two questions required a theoretical kind of analytical approach. I wasn't evaluating the cases that I studied, but more using them as a way to frame my thinking. After answering the five questions, which I'll go through, a model emerged to capture what occurs in professional education across partners, across perspectives, and across pedagogies. And that's the model where I'll end up in the discussion today um, and offer up for some conversation. So we'll begin with the landscape. Okay, how are we doing so far? We good? You with me? We're happy? Okay. So who's doing what where? In conducting a scan, it became clear that YOED is rather abundant. In addition to informal learning, such as on-the-job experiences, peer networks, we also have three main types of institutions that offer education to youth workers. We have youth organizations themselves that do in-house trainings. We have intermediary agencies that offer trainings and fellowship programs. And we have higher education offering various certificates, degree program, courses, minors. I'm not going into the details here, but I will say <clears throat> one of the things that I delve into in the report a bit more is that the growth in higher ed in this area has exploded over the last four years. In fact, there's a 900% increase in the past four years in college-based programs. And that includes any programs having to do with youth, youth work, youth development, youth studies, people call it different things. So something's happening. So typically, youth workers move in and out of this kind of nexus, right? And this was something that was kind of one of those aha and then duh moments. Do you know those moments? You kind of go, ah, aha, oh, duh. Poor, like, yeah, what, we knew that. But it was one of those moments for me because I never really thought about the movement that youth workers have where they might attend a course at a university, then they might attend a webinar offered by an intermediary agency, they might join a peer network or some type of collaborative and they move in and out of these spaces, these learning spaces. And we often design based on thinking that this is the only thing, right? This is the thing. So the implication of that then is that any attempt at really understanding the impact of YOED on youth workers' practice must then consider youth workers' history with professional education. So now across this nexus, I've identified 13 different models 
of youth work education. So 13 ways that youth workers learn their craft. Modeling, supervision, reflection, inquiry, conferences, mentoring, coaching, workshops, staff meetings, training, degree programs, peer networks, and fellowships. How many people here have attended a training? How many people here have attended uh, a degree program in youth work or youth studies? How many people here get supervised within their organization? How many people get good supervision? <laughs> good. <laughs> now, in order to make some comparative statements about the design of the 13 models, I organized them into a typology that includes five different elements. Academics love typologies, if you haven't noticed. Structure is really the defining category. And within it, there are three subcategories. I couldn't fit all of the details of this chart up here in a way that you'd be able to read it, but it will be in the report and you'll be able to see it later. But I just want to point out a couple of main ideas from it. So across the top row, the first subcategory is whether the training is held within the organization itself, whether it's intra-organizational, or across organizations, inter-organizational. The second subcategory is whether the format is a formal format or an informal format. And I define that by, are there predetermined rules of engagement? So if you attend a college class, there are some predetermined rules of engagement. You know you're getting a syllabi. You know there'll be some way you're getting grade. You know you'll have to do papers or some type of assignments. There are some predetermined agreed upon rules there. If you join a peer network, oftentimes, particularly informal peer networks, the group kind of decides what do we want to learn, how do we want to learn it. So there are different ways that the format itself kind of then dictates the learning and how the learning will occur. The third subcategory of the structure is whether it occurs individually or in groups. So bless you. So let's take supervision. So supervision typically happens intra-organizationally, right? It typically occurs informally with no predetermined format or agenda, and it also typically occurs one-on-one -on -one between the supervisor and the staffer. Conversely, a college course or a degree program occurs with students across organizations who come together to learn. It's a formal arrangement, and it's in a group format, unless you're doing independent study. So in supervision and other individually designed models, the content of the professional learning often emerges in relation to the individual interests and needs, struggles that they might be having. Yeah? How many supervisors in the room? So you guys know this, right? you know that most of your supervision, the content of the conversations, right, are around issues that the youth workers are having, things that you maybe observe that you want to help them to work on, yeah? So the content of learning comes from what's happening there, yeah? As opposed to um, a predetermined kind of curriculum where most, tra most trainings are organized this way. And this is, these are not evaluative statements, by the way. And as you'll see later, I actually think all of that is um, important and valuable. Within the group structures, so the fourth row down, within the group structures, the delivery tends to be dialogic, conversational. And it can be many other things as well, such as lectures, research projects. And the content, again, emerges 
in relationship to what I call stable knowledge. Stable knowledge, if you're doing training in your organization, what's the first thing that you teach new hires? It's the very first thing you teach your new hires. Your organizational mission, right? That's kind of a stable type of knowledge. It's stable for the organization. You teach them about the values of the organization, how we do things here. In a college classroom, you may learn stable knowledge through theoretical frameworks, professional standards and competencies. Now, if you look at what people are teaching across youth organizations, intermediaries, and higher ed, then the most common stable content that emerges is development. And predominantly that's derived from different theories of development like Erickson and Maslow, and more recently from positive youth development and the most often cited work is um, what Joyce Walker calls the blue book, and that's how I remember it now. The National Research Council's volume on community youth programs to promote positive development. Simply put, the theories stipulate that youth development requires the satisfaction of needs. So if you understand what young people need, you can intentionally design programs to meet those needs, hence promoting development. Now, while youth development is a common framework, it's certainly not the only framework. The other type of content that emerges is the more fluid content. The fluid content doesn't deal with the need, it deals with a need. So topics respond to various things ranging from media headlines, yeah, one of the kids in your program his brother got shot last night. Responds to funding contexts. It responds to government and societal priorities. It responds to pop culture, to environmental context, to school context, to you know, the upcoming tests, right? So what we're working on, the content that we're working on, helping youth workers kind of master, become effective, is both around stable values, principles, theories, as well as kind of these more fluid aspects, the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on in our lives. So right now in the OST world, if you go through different programs in out-of-school time, the programs are either STEM, or health. Why is that? Because that's where the money is. So our content very much gets driven by a lot of different things. It gets driven by who we are, what we think we've learned, what we think is best for young people that we work with, as well as a lot of other things. Yeah. And typically most of us figure out how to navigate all that somehow and barely kind of go unscathed. So that's kind of the geography, right? It's a little dry, I know. Um, but it's really the landscape, it's who's doing what, it's that nexus, it's the knowledge base, and it's the, uh, the design of it. Okay, so what? I always tell my students when they write their papers that they have to read their paper before they hand it in and they have to hear my voice. And at the end of their paper, my voice is, so what? Then they have to write another page or two to answer that question. So now we'll enter the sphere. So the sphere is the kind of three-dimensional space within which youth workers learn their craft. And I wondered from a theoretical standpoint, what conditions for learning make sense for youth workers? So I examined three learning theories to say, how do these fit? And those theories are, the first was adult learning theory. 
And the person most often known for adult learning theory is Malcolm Knowles. He was really the first person to say, you know, adult learners need something different than kids. Adult learners learn best when they can choose to participate. That kind of outs those mandated trainings right off the bat. They learn best when they have control over the direction and the timing of their learning. They can draw on their prior experiences and have input into the process. And they see relevance and practicality to their work. And finally, that they're treated with mutual respect. So to Knowles, these are the basic conditions under which adults learn best. So then it leads you to kind of ask, well, does my training, does my workshop, does my program, uh, does my orientation, does my supervision allow for these things? If this is how adults learn, am I creating these conditions, right? So that's one way to approach this information. Given these conditions, you might reasonably expect that your youth workers, your, your participants in a training, that their reactions to the training, to that learning, would be positive. That is, that they believe their time was well spent, that they walked away with something that made sense to them, that was useful, that they could maybe talk about in the organization or put into practice. But it has been critiqued as being limited in that, in that latter aspect, in terms of learning kind of knowledge and content and taking that and, and making it come to life on the ground. And we've all heard about the kind of divide between theory and practice. So I thought a second theoretical model might help to better bridge our understanding of that disconnect between theory and practice. And that's sociocultural theory. This stems from the writings of Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky. And Lev and Wenger, and many people in the room have probably already familiar with this model, argue that learning results from participating in communities of practice, right? So we don't necessarily learn so well when someone like me comes up here before a mic and has some things to say. This is not the best learning environment here. We learn when we get to participate and experience, when the words are brought to life, when we're doing it. Now recently, I came across this great study by Barnett and Coate, who did a study of academic disciplines in higher ed, all the different majors, from chemistry to nursing to social work. And they looked at how those different disciplines help to produce learning. And they define three aspects. Knowing, acting, and being. And I really liked this kind of notion of going beyond knowledge to acting and being. Because after all, what we know is rather useless in, in a lot of ways. It's what we do with that knowledge, right, that matters in the world, and particularly in our work. So there was something I really liked about this notion of being. And they talk about being as the most significant of the three dimensions. And that without being, the others can't take off. So what that means is that you have to be in the content, right? You have to become the results of your study, not only through knowing and acting within the discipline, but being with it. I think of it as a little bit of an analogy to um, to chemistry. Many people have taken a chemistry course in high school or college. So you know that the way chemistry is taught, there's the lecture and then the lab, right? So the lecture is the knowing. 
the lecture is, here's the knowledge. Here's what this, this field has learned, all right? The lab is the doing. Now, why do we have labs at all? Because some really smart person decided that no one was learning chemistry without doing, yeah? Now, in our field, then being pushes us to go a step further. Because you can think of our organizations as our labs, but when do you actually get to be in the discipline of youth work? Where do you get that space? It's not typical. And even though there's a growth in higher ed of youth studies, in what spaces have you been able to grapple with your colleagues about different issues with the kids, different issues with the work, different issues at the field level, the profession? Where do you get to, to play with those ideas? So I think it um, kind of pushes us to not only think about the lab, but also the, 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 the being, and being in that space where we then produce new knowledge. And I think, I'll go get back to this, but some of our models, some of our 13 models, do this pretty well. Now, the third theory I looked at came because even the being notion, even the knowing, acting, being, felt like, it still felt like there was something missing for me in helping me to understand what would be those best conditions for youth workers to learn their craft. So one can be effective with youth, right? We all know, and probably many of us have been ourselves, effective with youth good relationships with them, we can engage them, we listen, we hear them, we respond to them, right? We get them excited. You can do all of that in your space and have little understanding of the broader social and political issues within which the youth and the communities are functioning. So here I draw it upon critical pedagogy because critical pedagogy insists on education as a form of increased consciousness. Drawing upon the dialogical method of Paulo Freire, the classroom is a site that is co-created with teachers and students alike in order to liberate one's mind. So the traditional teacher-student relationship is turned upside down because the adult as knower cannot bring about liberation. Models that support this type of dialogue, communities of practice and practitioner research, for example, reposition the learner as active in their own learning process. And they reposition it also not only in terms of what's important to learn, but who decides and how is it going to be done? How many people here have had the experience of being in full control over their learning? What they learn, how they learn. Think back to being a child. Think back to play. Because play is a good site for understanding this, right? Because what happens in play? What happens when that little baby finds her toes? Oh, what's this? I'm gonna go explore this for a while. How many people as adults have that joyful experience and control over what there is to learn in the world, i.e. my toes, how I'm gonna learn about my toes, i.e. I'm gonna put them in my mouth, how many people have had this experience as an adult? Few. Few. Not often. <laughs> Last Saturday, right, Eric? So I think that 
that says something to how we approach education. And it's something to think about, particularly because I think youth work as a field requires that the education of youth workers and staff needs to kind of go back to that playful space. How are we doing? Good? Are we awake? Are we thinking? Good. So let's look at some of the cases of YoEd. And let's look at the three that are, will be presented, uh, represented on the panel today. And again, I'm not here to evaluate the three. I actually adore all of them. I think they're doing wonderful work. Um, but more to kind of put this out as three cases, three examples where uh, youth work education is happening in three very different ways. So the first is uh, a local youth organization, um, the Minneapolis Beacons. The second is an intermediary agency, and that's the Youth Work Institute at the Center for Youth Development. And the final is within higher education here at the University of Minnesota, the degree programs in youth studies and youth development leadership. So in the case of the Minneapolis Beacon, the director, Jenny Wright Collins, who will be on our panel this morning, leads her staff around 11 principles that she calls her manifesto. Her manifesto stems from a lot of different things. Some of the stable content that it comes from is positive youth development. And I think it's mixed in with some of Jenny. She asks staff to reflect on how what they are doing in their day-to-day -day practice is aligned to the beacon values in a shared atmosphere of mutual respect and trust. An atmosphere that in fact mirrors the very values and principles she wants the staff to create and model with the young people. So by design, every aspect of the training that she leads mirrors the values of the organization from beginning with an icebreaker in order to establish relationships with youth workers and with youth workers amongst themselves to working on challenging issues and solving problems together as a team. Through that lived experience in the training, the youth workers have a deepened and renewed sense of purpose that they then bring back to their individual centers. Now it helps that some of her staff are the alum of the program and grew up what they call beaconized. And I happen to know the beacons well because we started them in New York and their fabulous model, unfortunately under way too much attack as of recently, but a really good model. The culture in these beaconized environments is one where the youth workers feel home. We know this in good youth work organizations, the kids feel like home, right? So why shouldn't the youth workers also feel like they're home? Haley, who's the, um, one of the uh, coordinators in the Sheridan Beacon, and I just loved this quote, said, we each put in our strengths, what we bring to the table, and then we mix it up with what the kids have, and we make something new. Here you can see the principles of adult learning as well as kind of an apprenticeship model of learning where they're raising up the staff. And they do this in ways that mirror the principles of youth development. That is, the raising up of staff mirrors how they see the raising up of their kids. The second case is the Youth Work Institute, which is part of extension here at university, at the university. And Joyce Walker will be on our panel to represent the Youth Work Institute today. The institute is also grounded in a positive youth development framework, having roots in that best initiative curriculum I mentioned earlier. 
And the institute has eight signature programs. Some of them include leadership matters, quality matters, youth work matters. Across these signature courses is a set of curriculum with opportunities for participants to interact, reflect, and apply the concepts that they're learning in the training to their practice. The delivery might best be described as presentation of content alongside hands-on activities meant to ensure that knowledge is transferred to practice. Or more succinctly, as CeCe Grant stated, it's about supporting the artfuls to be more intentional about their work with young people. Competencies are less the focus of these signature programs than our professional judgment and reflective thinking. And Joyce Walker and Kate Walker have a great chapter in the book where they talk about this distinction between competencies and expert judgment. The center also supports two fellowship programs. Many of you have been through the fellowship programs or are in them now. The National After School Matters Fellowship and the more recent Walkabout Fellowship. The fellowships are based on an inquiry model where groups of practitioners across organizations come together and do an inquiry project, a research project, where they look into questions, burning questions that they have about their practice. What's really kind of cool about this model is that it's not just an academic exercise, it's a field building exercise because the practitioners who are engaged in these inquiry projects actually often get to publish their work um, in journals like After School Matters. The final case is the College of Education and Human Development, which has three options. They have a Bachelor of Science program in Youth Studies, a 16-credit minor in Youth Studies, and then they have a Master of Education in Youth Development Leadership. And Professor Stein, also to one of today's panelists, describes his teaching to me as, I get them to think non-programmatically. And that's achieved through that being, that being in the discipline. I understand this very, as very much akin to Fuster's notion, the quote I read when I began, of wanting us to stay in the moment, unnumbed by the anesthesia, if you will. The experience in these classes, as I observed on four separate occasions with three different faculty, is a bit of doing youth work in the classroom. It's non-hierarchical with students teaching and faculty learning. And as Bell Hooks taught us, when we stop thinking and evaluating along the lines of hierarchy and can value rightly all members of a community, we are breaking a culture of, of domination. And I see that very much happening in some of the classes there. So as a collective, you can see that YOED is, happens across multiple partners, across multiple perspectives, and across multiple pedagogies. So now we're getting into the final phase of the presentation. We still doing good? <laughs> so after all of that kind of uncovering, if you will, of who's doing what, what does it look like, what does it feel like, what are different theories of learning, look like against this stuff? What does that inform us about what can be good practice in youth work education? I started to ask myself, well, is the education of a practitioner the same as the education of a professional or the education of a leader? And I ask you to think about that for a second. It seems that when we train practitioners, we rely very heavily on competency frameworks. We kind of define the skill sets that they need and the appropriate professional behaviors that they should engage in. When we educate professionals, we tend to encourage critical thinking and focus on professional judgment and ethics. And when we produce leaders, we cultivate them. 
We promote freedom of thinking, creativity, and character. Now, I have come to suspect that actually all are necessary, but maybe at different times in one's professional trajectory. This comes particularly salient when you start thinking about the educational needs of youth workers in relation to their worker roles and responsibilities. So a beginner might need a different set of things than someone who's been in the field a while, as opposed to somebody who's now maybe even out of the field, out of doing practice day to day, and more doing things like this, and kind of helping to lead a dialogue of the field and what that looks like. And I think the education as we take on different roles in that trajectory become different. I'm not sure that we always intentionally design, though, professional education in relationship to where youth workers are in this trajectory. If we did, then we might ask things like, what is the new hire need? How, how new is new? A new hire may not be new to the field. Who should be involved in orientation of a new hire? The supervisor? The new staffer's peers? The young people? What is important to learn as a new hire? The values? The, the missions? The theories? And then what becomes different when new hires move from beginner to early practitioner to mid-practitioner to mid-career? How are they doing in their relational skills with young people? I would say two months into hire, supervisors really start honing in on this aspect, right? How are they doing with their relationships with the kids? So while orientation and training ground one in the values and the practice knowledge necessary to begin the work, as one enters the day-to-day -day mill, which would kind of be about your third box there, um, difficult situations begin to arise. And issues of self often get in the way of seeing situations without bias or predetermined judgment. I often tell my students who are mostly pre-service teachers and youth workers, when they're having a real difficult time with a kid, the first thing I ask them to do is think about what that kid is raising for them, instead of focusing on the kid. Because nine times out of 10, the, the difficult time you're having with a young person has more to do with your own whatever than the child. And if you can start working on self and working through some of that, oftentimes the relationships are better, the engagement is better. Now one needs ongoing supervision for this to happen, right? So this is the task of good supervision. That opportunity for dialogue, that opportunity to come to the table and say, I'm struggling with this kid or, or I'm not sure how to get this idea across that opportunity for, for feedback and reflection. In fact, I would argue that if the field is to continue to move in the direction of credentialing, which we have been, right, with this idea of credentialing frontline youth workers, that we'd be much better served if we credentialed supervisors instead of frontline workers. Um, I think the supervisors are in a good position to help deepen the craft and help youth workers develop efficacy for their work. Now, as practitioners come to see themselves as successful youth workers, they begin to think about some prolonged view of themselves in the field. Oftentimes, we enter and we're not too sure. We're kind of on shaky grounds. But as we kind of get into the work and feel good about the work we're doing, we start thinking, is there a career here? Is there something long term for me? And we know that predominantly it's very, very difficult to stay as a youth worker, to land a full-time gig as a youth worker, um, and you have to be very creative. But it can be done, absolutely can be done. 
So it's at this critical time in a youth worker's kind of career that it becomes important not just to get the orientation and the training within your own organization, but also to begin networking outside of your organization, to begin networking with folks that work in other youth service organizations. And, you know, that happens through these networks, it happens by attending conferences. So, one of the things that becomes interesting then is if we think about the development of youth workers as kind of a process, right, that's kind of longitudinal, and we know from youth development research that kids don't develop from one dose of a program, right? They grow and develop into themselves over time, slowly, and through multiple, multiple experiences with many people, schools, after schools, families, churches, right? Many people in their lives that they kind of interact with. So why should the development of youth workers into practitioners, professionals, leaders be any different? And when you think about this from that perspective, then the language, for me at least, shifts from thinking about professional development to thinking about professional capacity. Capacity, to me, is not a growing of what one knows, but it's an enrichment of one's social capital. Most of the practitioners I know who've been in the field for many, many years and are still at it with energy and enthusiasm are able to do that because they have many networks. They have networks within their own organizations. They have networks within their cities. They have networks with youth workers in other cities. And that networking allows you to start seeing yourself not just as a practitioner and what I do day to day, but as a leader in the field. What, is, what are the conversations that the field is having about this work? And when you step out of your organization and you start to see that there's a world, I can't tell you how many practitioners said to me when the book came out, I didn't know there was a field of youth work because we don't even use the term youth work too much anymore, by the way, but I'm going to hold on to it. <laughs> but I do think that people don't necessarily see themselves as connected. And you all in the room here are connected to many, many other people that are working in youth service organizations and that are trying to really support young people in different communities. And I think it's important to feel connected to that. When you start thinking about the role of professional education in building professional capacity, then I start thinking about not what is this curriculum or what is this content, but also how am I going to bring across this content in ways that connects it to what other people, not just in Minnesota, not just in the United States, but even internationally, the conversations that are being being had all around the globe right now on youth work. Um, recently, I just learned in Singapore, Singapore just formed a youth workers association. In fact, they just got their, their paperwork and they put up their little certificate on, on Facebook. And, um, you know, it was this kind of joyous Facebook moment for folks like, yay, another country with a youth worker association. When you start becoming involved in those conversations, I think your own learning shifts and your own needs for what you need to learn next shifts. Now, I think that actually the role of higher ed in building professional capacity is really, really critical. And I know I'm biased, but I'll say it anyway. I think part of that reason is not because faculty are experts, but I do think it's because faculty, number one, get paid to think about things and we have the time to think about things. We have the time to, to order five books and read them in a week. 
And I think that because of that, there's a fund of knowledge that faculty members have that sometimes when you're on the ground and you're working with young people and you get home and the only thing you want to do is hit your pillow, you just don't do it. And, and you shouldn't do it, maybe. You know, maybe it's not important that we all do the same thing. But we do need to be in partnership, right? Because I learned from you, you learned from me, and I think that universities can really bring something to the table. I was recently in um, Pittsburgh. Oh, it's pouring out there. I was recently in Pittsburgh, and um, I did a talk called What is Youth Work and Why Should We Care? And at the end of that, uh, the director of a program came up to me and said, you know, we are having such a difficult time in our organization. Our resources are shrinking. We just don't have time to talk about this stuff. And I grabbed one of the faculty members from the program, and I, and I made them exchange emails and phone numbers, and I said, here, you have people here, you have students in this program that could go into the agency, work with you guys, and figure some stuff out, right? And I think that that's all really good learning and really good partnership that can happen. And I want to cite an example um, here in Minnesota that I learned of recently and had the opportunity to kind of spend some time with folks that are doing this work. But it's a good example of um, the Masters in Youth Development Leadership Program at the University of Minnesota in partnership with the St. Paul Parks and Recreation Community Youth Work Team. And what's happening there is that together, uh, a faculty member, Michael Bazerman, and several of his graduate students are working with the folks at the Parks and Rec, and together they've developed a training model to support new rec leaders. So they've been doing hiring over the last couple of days, and the young people are at the table helping with the hiring, and they've developed an entire rubric for how people move through and become effective youth workers, and they did it not because faculty member, you know, sat in his or her office and came up with some great typology and brought it to the organization and said, here, you know, how does this feel? But rather they did it at the table together and came up with it together. So it's in the language of the staff members and it's in the language of the youth. So in that way it becomes very helpful. So that's just one example of a good kind of collaborative model. And I think as a collective, we begin to ask, what do we each bring to the table in the professional education of youth workers? And for me, those interesting models are those that do not lead with knowing, but with being, and being together. What can we pursue together to advance our knowledge and to advance the work? To me, it's this space where one can take a philosophical stance rather than a knowing stance. Phil philosophers take an idea and they play with it. So I want to go back to this notion of how, as adults, we get to engage our learning through play. And I would give you all a homework assignment. And the homework assignment, if you choose to take it, is to just pick a concept, a word, something that you, you know, development, engagement, any of these words that you kind of you know, come into contact with, and just play with that word. And don't play with it from within your own discipline. Play with it outside of your discipline. What, is, what does engagement mean between a, 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 you know, a doctor and a patient, right? Play with it outside your discipline. Go large, right? What does engagement mean to an artist? What, is an engage, what does engagement mean to um, a frog? I don't know. Play, yeah? And I think that the interesting thing about playing in that way is that unlike science, which takes an idea and tests it from one disciplinary perspective, philosophy, you get to go from, from different vantage points. And I love when I see youth workers, and Jenny is a great example, I'm gonna embarrass her some more today, um, is a great example of someone who, along their trajectory, has been able to take different concepts, play with them, make them her own. Now they're her manifesto, 
and she lives them and plays with them more with her staff, with the young people. And I think those are the spaces that keep us away from becoming the expert and, and the numbing of that, that that can happen sometimes. So in concluding, I just want to say that I really began this journey with the very simple goal of mapping youth work education across the country in the hope of determining where and how attention was being played to how youth workers learn to build developmentally responsive relationships. Because that's something that I've been interested in for a long time and I thought I would focus on, on that one thing. But if you're committed to the journey and not the outcome, then the pathways to follow along the way become numerous. And I've traveled down many, and all were educative. What resulted are realizations that were, while perhaps are not new in isolation, maybe as a collective can cast professional education as a building of capacity over time with different partners and different perspectives and different pedagogies. Thank you. And please, when you leave here, don't forget to thank a youth worker today.